Look, I think all eyes are going to be on this OPEC Plus meeting, so maybe let's just start with that. I haven't seen or spoken to any analysts out there who expects the OPEC Plus uh, cartel to change their production. And if anything, there seems to be a view that they're just going to keep the existing production cuts in space for the foreseeable future. It's certainly the easiest of all the options to take right now. An option to either cut or to increase output is rife with kind of political problems in the group as a whole. How do you divide up a cut? How do you divide up an increase? So it's easy just to say, okay, it's summertime. There's going to be incremental crude burn in most of the Middle East. Mm. The market's going to be tighter because of higher demand and lower supply. So let's just go with it. So it's the, it's the easy decision for the moment. And yet there are some members of the group, the likes of UAE, Iraq, who keep pushing for higher production quotas. And I just wonder how we can end up know, with an outcome out of this OPEC plus meeting where all of the stakeholders are satisfied because clearly, you know, the Saudis are looking at the market and saying this isn't the time to put more barrels on the market. But at the same time, you have big members, you know, the UAE saying that they want to be producing more. And indeed, they've just recently increased their maximum capacity. So I think the issue is how long can you get away with uh, producing a little bit more uh, and not have anybody scream about it? Because undoubtedly, we have not only the pressure from those two countries, from the UAE and Iraq, but there's pressure from uh, other members of what we call the Fragile Five. Certainly Iran is among them, but it's Libya and Venezuela and Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, and they all have activities underway to attract more capital, and they can also increase production with very limited effort. I would say that uh, Venezuela could go up a half a million a day, Libya could go up three or four hundred a day. Uh, and Nigeria has been producing 400 a day more than they currently are. So there's a lot of leeway in those four uh, wayward countries that are not really part of the voluntary cuts. Yeah. Uh, let me just ask you about Saudi Arabia specifically. What, what number do you think they're targeting? What is a level for the oil price that you think they're comfortable with? Uh, there are three different numbers that are bandied about. One is some independent analysts say the fiscal break even for whatever that is worth is about $110 a mm. barrel. There are others who say that a tighter look at the market uh, would put it in the $93, $94 range. But we recently had a very senior official from the government at the ministerial level at a meeting in, a, uh, in another Gulf country saying we can live with low $80. Mm. And they can. They can because they have a very high credit rating. They have the highest credit rating of any country in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. They have an ability to do more IPOs with their state-owned companies and their borrowing capacity is enormous. So they can, they can go uh, mm. comfortably at an $80 price. So I was speaking to uh, another analyst yesterday, and he pointed to several factors. He was bearish oil. He has a view that oil is going to go to $70 in the second half of this year. And he was pointing to the amount of spare capacity that OPEC are sitting on right now, the inventory situation. We saw the report come out yesterday, uh, the fact that uh, demand is looking a little weak. And I wonder, you know, all of these factors together were actually the surprise to the markets is going to be that the price of oil will continue to drop in the second half. Where do you stand on that debate? Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of on the bearish side of that debate, and mm -hmm. I start with the kind of the macro outlook. The macro outlook is deteriorating around the world. We had the U.S. growth kind of leading the industrialized world all of last year, ending the last quarter in over 3.5% growth, under 2% in Q1. We have a lot of uh, surveys now of uh, private uh, economists, I'm not talking about the IMF or the World Bank, where they had a kind of 2.5 percent number for global growth this year. Now some of them are revising down toward 2 percent. If, if there is a, a move from 2.5 to 2 percent, that is consistent given the oil intensity of GDP mm. with under a million barrels a day of demand growth. So yeah. uh, that points to weakness, particularly when we look at the Atlantic Basin, we look at the U.S., Guyana, Canada, Mexico to some degree, but Brazil in particular, and then Norway. You know, we have more than a million and a half, probably closer to two million a day coming out of those countries. So mm -hmm. that would be a very weak market. Mm, and indeed, if this. President Trump comes back, you know, drill baby drills, so they're going to get even more supply out of, out of the U.S. potentially, which doesn't help. I want to ask you about China. How much of a swing factor are China playing in terms of the demand outlook here? So China plays a swing factor. On the demand side, we don't really know. What really counts for China are imports and exports. And they adopted a policy in 2008, a year in which oil was hit at $147 Brent. People thought it was going to hit 200 
It ended the year at $41, a $42 rent, and they adopted a policy of buy low and sell high. And they've been pretty consistent on that. Now, there are a lot of political issues involved as President Xi tries to control the once independent companies. But the basic structure is to build inventory when you can. Uh, they have capacity to build 2 billion barrels. Mm -hmm. I think they're at about a billion, two or 300 million. They have the largest uh, inventory of any country in the world based on import needs and demand needs. So uh, they're still going to be doing that. Yeah. What do you think it would take for OPEC Plus to start putting more barrels on the market again? What are they waiting for? Well, I think there are uh, two different time horizons on it. One is wait and pray that the made-up number that they have on oil demand is going to materialize, in which case the market can tighten up pretty quickly. There is a little bit of an exaggeration on the amount of spare capacity in the world. Uh, there are other things going on. Mm. Russia is not standing still, and I don't yeah. know, nobody knows what's going to happen to Russia internationally, but they're now developing the Vostok field. That's a two million barrel a day field, and they plan to have a good half a million barrel a day of incremental supply in the market this year. So I think one of the movers traditionally of uh, Saudi Arabia in particular is that if supply grows too quickly to try to stem it by putting more oil in the market, reducing prices, and making it a punishment to produce more by bringing price levels down below the cost. Mm, I believe they call that a peric victory. So they're going to be winning and punishing others, but at the same time, as you say, that break-even level is very high right now for Saudi Arabia.